The professor shook his head like someone unwilling to be convinced. I tried to pursue the conversation. He didn't reply, but just gave the SIG NAL for departure. I saw clearly that his silence was nothing but concentrated ill humor. All the same I valiantly picked up my burden and hurried after Hans, who was following my uncle. I didn't want to be left behind for I was tremendously worried about losing sight of my companions. I trembled at the thought of getting lost in the depths of the labyrinth. In any case, if the ascending route was becoming more difficult, I consoled myself by thinking that it was bringing me closer to the surface of the earth. It was a hope. Every step confirmed it, and I rejoiced at the idea of seeing my little Grauben again. At midday the walls of the tunnel changed appearance. I noticed this from the dimming of the electric light reflecting from them. The covering of lava was being replaced by bare rock. The massif was made up of layers at an angle, often in fact completely perpendicular. We were in the middle of the transition era, in full Silurian period.70, it's obvious, I said to myself. During the second era of the earth, the sediment from the water formed these schists, these limestones, these sandstones. We are turning our backs on the primary granite. We are like people from Hamburg who take the Hanover Road to go to Lübeck. I should have kept my remarks to myself. But my geologist's temperament overcame my caution, and Uncle Leidenbrock overheard my exclamations. What is the matter then? Look. I replied, showing him the successive varieties of sandstones and limestones and the first signs of shale formations. Well, here we are at the period when the first plants and animals appeared. Do you really think so? But look, examine, observe. 70 so-called because the terrains of this period are very common in the parts of Britain formerly inhabited by the Celtic tribe, the Sillars. JV, I made the professor shine his lamp on the walls of the tunnel. I expected some exclamation from him. But he didn't say a word, merely continued on his way. Had he understood me or not? Did he not want to admit, because of his self-respect as an uncle and a scientist, that he had made a mistake in choosing the eastern tunnel, or did he want to explore the passage to the end? It was clear in any case that we had left behind the route taken by the lava, and that this path couldn't lead to the source of Snaefels's heat. However, I wondered whether I wasn't placing too much importance on the change in the formation. Was I not deluding myself? Were we really crossing the layers of rock superimposed on the granite foundation? If I'm right, I thought, I'll surely find traces of primitive plants, and it will be self-evident to anyone. Let's look. I hadn't gone a hundred yards further before incontrovertible proof appeared before my eyes. It was to be expected, for during the Silurian period there were more than 1500 species of vegetables and animals in the seas. My feet, used to the hard ground of the lava, were suddenly treading on a dust composed of fragments of plants and shells. On the walls could be clearly seen the outlines of seaweeds and club mosses. 71 Professor Leidenbrock could no longer entertain any doubt, but he closed his eyes, I imagine, and continued on his way at a steady pace. This was obstinacy taken beyond all limit. I couldn't stand it any more. I picked up a perfectly preserved shell, one that had belonged to an animal more or less like the present-day woodlouse. Then I caught up with my uncle and said to him, See. Well, he replied calmly, it is the shell of a crustacean of the extinct order of trilobites. Nothing else. But do you not conclude from that? What you conclude yourself? Yes. Fine. We have left the granite STRA tum behind, together with the route followed by the lava. It is possible that I made a mistake, but I will only be certain of my error when I have reached the end of the gallery. You're right to follow such a course of action, uncle, and I would support it, if we weren't in greater and greater danger. Of what? of the shortage of water. Well, we will ration it, Axel. Twenty rationing was indeed necessary. We didn't have enough water left for more than three days, as I found out that evening at supper time. Nor could we have much hope of coming across an open spring in the ground of the transition era, a dismal perspective, 71 The outlines of seaweeds and club mosses, seaweeds and club mosses O.C. occurred in radically different environments, and at different times, is Vern here deliberately mixing opposites. The whole of the following day, the tunnel lined up its endless arches before us. We walked almost without a word. Hans's silence was catching. The route was not climbing, at least not noticeably. Sometimes it even seemed to be going down. But such a tendency, in any case very slight, can't have reassured the professor, for the nature of the strata didn't change, and the signs of the transition era became more and more obvious. The electric lamp produced a wonderful sparkling on the schists, the limestone, and the old red sandstone of the walls. You might have thought you were in a trench excavation in Devon, the county which gave its name to this sort of formation. Magnificent marble specimens covered the walls, some in agate gray with white veins standing out in various places, others crimson or yellow with red spots. 
Further on were samples of griot marble and dark colors, but with limestone providing bright highlights. Most of the marble displayed the outlines of primitive animals. Since the day before, creation had made clear signs of progress. Instead of rudimentary trilobites, I spotted evidence of a more perfect order, amongst others, ganoid fish and those saurians where the paleontologist's eye has discerned the first reptile forms. The Devonian seas were inhabited by a large number of animals of this latter species, and deposited thousands and thousands of them onto the newly formed rocks. It became plain that we were moving back up the scale of animal life, of which man forms the peak. But Professor Leidenbrock didn't seem to be paying attention to this. He was hoping for one of two things, either that a vertical shaft would somehow open up beneath his feet and thus allow him to descend again, or that he would be blocked by some obstacle. But evening came without either hope being fulfilled. On the Friday, after a night when I began to be tortured by thirst, our little team plunged again into the tunnel's meanders. After ten hours' march, I noticed that the reflection of our lamps on the surfaces was decreasing to a remarkable degree. The marble, the schist, the limestone, and the sandstone on the walls were giving way to a dark covering not giving off any light. At a moment when the tunnel was especially narrow, I leaned on the left-hand wall. When I withdrew my hand, it was completely black. I looked closer. We were in the middle of a coal deposit. A coal mine. I exclaimed. A mine without miners. Who knows? I know, replied the professor firmly. And I am certain that this ton nail cutting through the coal seams was not made by human hands. But I do not really care whether it is nature's work or not. The time for supper has arrived. Let us therefore sup. Hans prepared some food. I hardly ate anything, but drank the few drops of water that made up my ration. The guide's half-full flask was all that remained for three men. After the meal, my two companions stretched out on their blankets and found a remedy to their tiredness in sleep. I myself couldn't doze off, and merely counted the hours till morning. On Saturday we left at 6. 20 minutes later, we arrived at a huge excavation. I realized then that human hands could not have hollowed out this coal pit for in that case the arches would necessarily have been underpinned. Here they literally held up only by some miracle of equilibrium. This cavernous space was 100 feet wide by 150 feet high. The earth had been violently pushed aside by some underground upheaval. The solid ground, subjected to some huge force, had split wide open, leaving this spacious void, never before penetrated by the inhabitants of the earth. On these dark walls was written the whole history of the coal period, and a geologist could easily read its successive stages. The beds of coal were separated by strata of sandstone or compacted clay, as if crushed under the uppermost layers. During this age of the world which preceded the secondary era, the earth became covered in immense vegetation due to the tropical heat combined with a permanent humidity. An atmosphere of steam enveloped all parts of the globe, shielding it from the sun's rays. Hence the conclusion that the high temperatures could not have come from that new source of heat. Perhaps the sun was not ready to play its brilliant role. But in any case climates did not yet exist, and a torrid heat spread across the entire surface of the globe, the same at the poles as at the equator. Where did it come from? The center of the globe. Despite Professor Leidenbrock's theories, a violent fire smoldered in the bowels of the spheroid. Its effects were felt even in the outermost layers of the Earth's crust. The plants, shielded from the life-giving radiation of the sun, did not produce flowers or scent, but their roots drew vigorous life from the burning soils of the first days. There were few trees, only herbaceous plants, huge grassy areas, ferns, club mosses, and sigillarias 72 and asterophyllites, rare families whose species were then numbered in thousands. It was this exuberant vegetation which produced the coal. The Earth's crust, still elastic, followed the movements of the liquid mass it encased. Hence a large amount of cracking and subsiding. The plants, dragged under water, gradually built up considerable piles of matter. Next came the action of nature's chemistry, on the bottom of the seas, the vegetable masses became peat. Then, thanks to the effect of the gases, and in the heat from the fermentation, they underwent a complete mineralization. 72 sigillarias, fossil trees, leaving impressions in coal deposits, asterophyll lights, fossil plants, with leaves arranged in whorls, found in coal formations. In this way were formed the huge layers of coal. These, however, will be used up by overconsumption in less than three centuries, if the industrialized nations do not take care. These ideas passed through my mind while I looked at the coal riches accumulated in this section of the Earth's mass. Such riches will probably never be opened up. The exploitation of these faraway mines would require too much effort. What would be the point in any case, when coal is spread over the Earth's surface, so to speak, in a large number of count tries? So these untouched straight eyes saw will probably remain exactly the same when the Earth's last hour sounds.
We carried on walking meanwhile, and I was the only one of the three companions to forget how long the route was, deeply engrossed as I was in my geological considerations. The temperature remained virtually the same as during our passage through the Lalas and the Schists. On the other hand, my nose was distressed by a very pronounced smell of hydrocarbon. I immediately realized that in this tunnel there was a significant amount of the dangerous gas which miners call fire damp, and whose explosions have so often caused terrible disasters. 73 Fortunately, our lighting came from the ingenious Ruhmkorff lamps. If by misfortune, we had carelessly explored this tunnel holding torches, an awful explosion would have terminated the journey by destroying those carrying it out. Our excursion through the coal lasted until evening. My uncle could hardly control the impatience that the horizontality of the route was generating in him. The darkness, impenetrable at more than 20 yards, prevented any estimation of how far the tunnel ran. I was beginning to believe that it must be endless, when suddenly and without warning, at 6 p.m., a wall appeared right in front of us. There was no way through, whether to the left or to the right, above or below. We had reached the end of a cul-de-sac. Well so much the better. Bellowed my uncle. At least I know what I'm up against. We are not on Sacknus M's route, and our only choice is to turn round and go back. Let's rest for a night, and within three days we will be back at the point where the two tunnels fork. Yes, if we are strong enough. And why should we not be? Because tomorrow there will be no water left at all. And no courage left either. Asked the professor, looking at me sternly. I did not dare reply. 21 The following day, we left very early. Speed was of the essence. We were five days march from the parting of the ways. I will not dwell on our suffering during the return. My uncle bore it with the anger of a man who knows that he is less strong, Hans with the 73 smell, disasters, fire damp has no smell, hence the danger. Resignation of his peaceful nature, myself, I must admit, with complaints and despair, for I was unable to just grin and bear it. As I foresaw, the water ran out completely at the end of our first day's march. Our supplies of liquid were limited to gin, but this diabolical spirit burned your throat, and I couldn't even bear to look at it. I found the heat stifling. Tiredness prevented me from moving. More than once, I almost fell down in a faint. On such occasions a halt was called, and my uncle or the Icelander comforted me as best they could. But I could see that the professor was already reacting with difficulty against the extreme fatigue and the torment produced by the lack of water. Finally on Tuesday the 7th of July, dragging ourselves along on our hands and knees, half dead, we reached the point where the two tunnels split. I lay there, a lifeless mass, stretched out on the lava floor. It was 10 in the morning. Hans and my uncle, leaning back against the walls, tried to nibble a few crumbs of biscuit. Long groans escaped from my swollen lips. I fell into a deep faint. After a time, my uncle drew near and lifted me up in his arms. Poor child, he murmured in tones of real pity. I was touched by these words, not being used to such tenderness from the tough professor. I seized hold of his trembling hands in mine. He allowed me to do this, while looking at me. His eyes were damp. I then saw him take the flask hanging at his side. To my amazement, he put it to my lips, drink. Had I heard properly. Had my uncle gone mad. I looked at him with a wild expression. I couldn't take in what he said. Drink, he repeated. And tilting the flask, he emptied it between my lips. Oh infinite ecstasy. A mouthful of water came and wetted my fiery lips and tongue, only one, but it was enough to bring back the life that was tiptoeing away from me. I thanked my uncle by putting my hands together. Yes, one mouthful of water. The last do you hear? The very last. I carefully kept it at the bottom of my flask. Twenty times, a hundred times, I had to resist a terrible desire to drink it. But no, Axel, I was keeping it for you. Uncle. I whispered as large tears formed in my eyes. Yes, poor child, I knew that when you arrived at this junction, you would drop down half dead, and I kept my last drops of water to bring you back to life. Thank you, thank you. However little my thirst was quenched, I had nevertheless got back some strength. The muscles in my throat contracted until this point, now relaxed, and the burning in my lips diminished. I could speak again, look, we now have only one course of action, since we have no water, we must retrace our path. While I spoke, my uncle avoided looking at me. He hung his head, and his eyes avoided mine. We have to turn round, and follow the path back to Snaefells. May God give us the strength to climb back up to the peak of the crater. Go back said my uncle, as if replying to himself rather than to me. Yes, go back, without wasting a moment. There came a long silence. So as a consequence, Axel, said the professor in a strange tone, those few drops of water have not given you back your courage and energy. Courage. I see you are as overcome as before, giving voice to words of day pair. 
What sort of man was I dealing with, and what plans was his fearless spirit still hatching? What, you don't want to give up the expedition, at a moment when all the signs show it can succeed? Never. So we must prepare to die. No, Axel, no. Go if you want. I do not wish your death. Hans will go with you. Leave me alone. Abandon you. Leave me, I tell you. I began this journey, I will carry it out to the bitter end, or else not come back at all. Off you go, Axel. Go. My uncle spoke very agitatedly. His voice, tender for a moment, had now become hard and threatening. He was struggling with a somber energy against the impossible. I did not want to abandon him at the bottom of this chasm, but, from another point of view, my instinct for self-preservation urged me to flee. The guide followed this scene with his usual indifference. Yet he understood what was happening between his two companions. Our gestures were enough to show the different ways that each of us wanted to drag the other. But Hans did not appear to be especially interested in this question where his life was at stake, he seemed ready to leave if the SIG NAL was given, ready to remain at the least wish of his master. What I would have given at that moment to be able to speak to him. My words, my complaints, my tone would have won his cold nature over. These dangers that the guide did not seem to suspect, I would have made him understand them in the most literal way. The two of us together might perhaps have convinced the stubborn professor. If need be, we could have forced him to return to the heights of Snaefels. I went over to Hans. I put my hand on his. He did not move. I pointed at the root up to the crater. He still remained motionless. My gasping face showed all my suffering. The Icelander gently shook his head, and, calmly indicating my uncle, master, he said in Icelandic. No, you fool. He's not the master of your life. We must flee, we must drag him with us. Do you hear, do you understand? I seized Hans by the arm, trying to make him get up. I was wrestling with him. My uncle intervened. Calm yourself, Axel. You will not get anything out of this impassive servant. So hear what I have to offer. I crossed my arms, looking squarely at my uncle. Only the lack of water puts an obstacle to the achievement of my aims. In that eastern tunnel, made of lilas, schists, and coals, we did not find a single liquid molecule. We may possibly be more fortunate in the western tunnel. I shook my head with a look of utter disbelief. Point seven four. Hear me out, continued the professor in a louder voice. While you were lying there without moving, I went to reconnoiter the shape of the tunnel. It forces its way directly into the bowels of the earth and will lead us, in a few hours, to the granite rock formations. There we should meet abundant springs. The nature of the rock implies this, and intuition and logic combine to support my conviction. Now here is what I have to offer you. When Columbus asked his crews for three more days to reach the new lands, his crews, ill and terror-stricken, nevertheless granted his request, and he discovered a new world. I, the Columbus of these underground regions, am asking for only one more day. If at the end of that time I have not encountered the water we need, I swear to you that we will return to the surface of the earth. In spite of my irritation, I was touched by these words and by the way my uncle had to force himself to speak in such a way. All right. I cried. Let it be as you wish, and may God reward your superhuman energy. You have only a few hours left in which to tempt fate. Let us go. 22 We set off again, this time down the other tunnel. Hans led the way as usual. We hadn't gone further than a hundred yards, when the professor, shining his lamp along the walls, bellowed, these are primitive formations. We're on the right route, come on, come on. When the earth slowly cooled during the first days of the world, the decrease in volume produced disruptions, breakages, shrinkages, and cracks in the crust. Our present corridor was a fissure of this sort through which the eruption of the liquid granite had formerly poured out. Its thousand paths formed an impossible maze through the primeval ground. As we went further down, the succession of strata making up the primitive system appeared more and more clearly. Geological Science 74 I shook, head, these three and a half paragraphs are new in the 1867 edition. In their place, the 1864 edition read, Hans, said my uncle, shaking his head. Then he examined the weapon attentively. Axel, he said to me in a serious tone, this knife considers the primitive system as the base of the mineral crust, and has analyzed it into three different strata, schists, gneisses, and mica schists resting on that immovable rock called granite. Never had mineralogists been in such perfect circumstances for studying nature in situ. The drill, a brutal and unintelligent machine, could not bring the internal texture back to the surface of the globe, but we were going to examine it with our eyes, touch it with our hands. Through the layer of schists, colored in wonderful green shades, there meandered metallic seams of copper and manganese, with traces of platinum and gold. I dreamed when I saw these riches hidden away in the bowels of the earth, which human greed would never enjoy. 
These treasures were so deeply buried by the upheavals of the first days, that neither pick nor drill will ever be able to tear them from their tomb. After the schists came the gneisses, of stratiform structure, remarka ble for their regularity and their parallel folia, 75 then the mica schists laid out in huge laminae, standing out because of their scintillations in the white mica. The light from the lamps, reflected by the tiny facets of the mass of rock, shone its fiery flashes at all angles, and I imagined I was traveling through a hollowed-out diamond with the rays disintegrating into a thou sand dazzling lights. At about six, this festival of light reduced noticeably and then almost stopped. The rock faces took on a crystallized tint, but of a dark shade. The mica mixed more intimately with feldspar and quartz, to form that most rock-like of all rocks, the stone that is the hardest of all, the one that holds up the four stories of the globe's formation without being crushed. We were walled up in a huge granite prison. It was eight in the evening. There was still no water. I was in terrible pain. My uncle walked ahead. He wouldn't stop. He kept turning his head to one side in order to detect murmurs from any spring. But none came. Meanwhile my legs refused to carry me any further. I resisted the ag ny so that my uncle would not have to call a halt. It would have been a blow of despair for him, as the day was coming to an end, the last one he had. Finally my strength left me. I uttered a cry and fell down. Help! I'm dying! My uncle came back. He examined me, crossing his arms. Then the leaden words came from his lips, it is finished. A terrifying gesture of anger struck my eyes one last time, and I closed them. When I opened my eyes again, I saw my two companions motionless, rolled up in their blankets. Were they asleep? For my part, I could not find a moment's repose. My distress was too great, and above all the thought that my sufferings were not going to find any relief. My uncle's last words 75 folia, Latin, leaves, lamini are thin layers, rang out in my ears, it is finished, since, in such a weak state, we couldn't even think about reaching the surface of the earth again. There were more than four miles of earth's crust. This mass seemed to be leaning with all its weight on my shoulders. I felt crushed, and I wore myself out with violent struggles to turn over on my granite bed. A few hours went by. A deep silence hung around us, the silence of the grave. Nothing reached us through these walls, each at least five miles thick. Nevertheless, in the middle of my lethargy, I thought I heard a noise. It was dark in the tunnel. I looked more carefully and thought I could see the Icelander slipping away with the lamp in his hand. Why was he going? was Hans leaving us to our fate. My uncle was asleep. I tried to cry out. My voice could not find a way through my dried up lips. It was now very dark, and the last sounds had just died away. Hans is leaving us. I cried. Hans, Hans. These words, I shouted them inside myself. They went no further. But after the first moment of terror, I felt ashamed of my suspicion of a man whose conduct had been beyond reproach until now. His departure could not be running away. Instead of going up the tunnel, he was heading down. Evil intentions would have taken him towards the top, not the bottom. This argument calmed me down a little, and I came back to another order of ideas. Only a serious reason could have torn Hans, that peaceful man, from his rest. Was he in search of something? Had he heard some murmur during the silent night, one which had not reached me? 23 for an hour, my delirious brain ran through all the conceivable ray suns that could have made the calm hunter act in this way. The most absurd ideas intersected in my head. I thought I was about to go mad. But finally the sound of feet could be heard in the depths of the chasm. Hans was coming back up. An indefinite light began to slide along the rock face, then flowed through the mouth of the corridor. Hans reappeared. He went up to my uncle, put a hand on his shoulder, and gently woke him. My uncle sat up. What is it? Baden, replied the hunter. It must be the case that, under the inspiration of extreme suffering, everyone becomes multilingual. I did not know a single word of Danish, and yet I instinctively understood our guide's utterance. Water, water. I shouted, clapping my hands and gesticulating like a lunatic. Water. Repeated my uncle. Havar. Nedit, replied Hans. Where? Below. I could understand everything. I had seized hold of the hunter's hands, and was holding them tight, while he looked calmly at me. The preparations for departure didn't take long, and soon we were moving down a corridor with a gradient of one in three. An hour later, we had covered about a mile and a quarter and gone down about 2,000 feet. At that moment, I distinctly heard an unusual sound running along the side walls of the granite rock face, a sort of muffled rumbling like distant thunder. During the next half hour of walking, not meeting the promised spring, I felt anxiety taking hold of me again, but then my uncle told me where the noise was coming from. Hans was not wrong. What you hear is the roaring of fast-flowing water. A stream. There can be no doubt about it. An underground river is flowing around us. 
We walked faster, overstimulated by hope. I forgot about my tiredness. The sound of babbling water was already refreshing me. It was increasing noticeably. The water, having for a long time remained over our heads, was now running behind the left-hand rock face, roaring and splashing. I frequently touched the rock with my hand, hoping to find traces of condensation or water oozing through. But in vain. Another half hour went by. Another mile and a quarter was covered. It became clear at this point that, while he had been away, the hunter hadn't been able to continue his search any further. Guided by an instinct peculiar to mountain men, to water diviners, he had felt the presence of a stream through the rock, but had certainly not seen the precious liquid, and he had not drunk any. Soon it became obvious that, if we continued walking, we would be moving away from the current, whose murmuring was now tending to diminish. We turned back. Han stopped at the precise point where the stream seemed to be the closest. I sat near the rock wall, while the waters ran with great violence only two feet away from me. But a granite wall stood between us. Without thinking, without wondering whether some way didn't exist of getting to this water, I gave in to an immediate feeling of despair. Hans looked at me, and I thought I could see a smile playing on his lips. He rose and picked up the lamp. I followed. He went up to the rock face. I watched him. He put his ear to the dry stone, and slowly moved it around, listening with great concentration. I understood that he was looking for the precise point where the noise from the stream was loudest. He located this spot in the left-hand wall three feet above the ground. I was highly excited. I didn't dare guess what the hunter planned to do. But I had to understand, and applaud, and embrace him passionately, when I saw him lift up the pickaxe to attack the very rock. Saved. I cried out. Yes, repeated my uncle in a frenzy. Hans is right. Oh the excellent hunter. We would never have thought of that. I cannot disagree. Such a solution, however simple, would not have entered our minds. Nothing could be more dangerous than striking a blow with a pick into the structure of the globe. What if a landslide happened and crushed us to death? What if the water, bursting through the rock, drowned us? These fears were far from imaginary, but at such a moment the danger of landslide or flood couldn't stop us. Our thirst was so strong that to quench it we would have dug into the ocean bed itself. Hans set to work, a task which neither my uncle nor I could have completed. Our hands would have been so impatient that the rock would have flown into pieces under our hurried blows. The guide, in contrast, was calm and moderate, slowly chipping away at the rock with a long se rise of little blows, creating an opening six inches wide. I heard the noise of the stream increase, and I could already feel the life-giving water spurting on my lips. Soon the pick had gone two feet into the granite wall. The work had lasted over an hour. I was writhing with impatience. My uncle wanted to bring in the big guns. I had difficulty holding him back, and he was already seizing his pickaxe, when suddenly a whistling noise was heard. A jet of water shot out of the rock and hit the opposite face. Hans, almost knocked down by the blow, could not hold back a cry of pain. I understood why when I thrust my hand into the liquid jet, and in turn uttered a wild exclamation. The spring was boiling. Water at 100 degrees. I shouted. It will soon cool down, replied my uncle. The corridor filled with steam, while a brook formed, and headed off into the underground meanders. Soon we were drinking our first mouthfuls. Oh, what ecstasy. What indescribable gratification. What was this water? Where did it come from? I didn't care. It was water and, although still hot, gave back to our hearts the life that was escaping from them. I drank without stopping, without even tasting. It was only after a minute of delight that I shouted, but it's full of iron. Excellent for the stomach, replied my uncle, and full of minerals. Our journey is as good as a trip to spa or toplets. 76, oh, how satisfying it is. I am not surprised, water from five miles below ground. It tastes of ink, which is not unpleasant. A vital commodity Hans has given us. I propose therefore to call this brook after the person who was our salvation. Agreed. The name, Hans Bach, 77 was decided on the spot. Hans did not become any the prouder because of this. Having drunk in moderation, he sat back in a corner with his usual calm. 76 Spa, in Belgium, Toplitz, German name for Toplita in modern Romania. 77 Bach, German for Brook. Now, I said, we mustn't let the water be lost. Why bother? I do not imagine this source will ever dry up. It makes no difference. Let's fill the water bottle and flasks, and then try to block up the hole. My advice was followed. Using granite chips and coarse cloth, Hans tried to block the gash made in the wall. It was not easy. Our hands got scalded to no avail, there was too much pressure, and our attempts produced no result. It's obvious, I said, that the water-bearing beds are at too great a height to judge from the strength of the jet. There can be no doubt about it. 
If this water column is 32,000 feet high, it will be at a pressure of a thousand atmospheres. But I have an idea. What is it? Why are we trying so hard to block the hole? But, because. I would have been hard put to find a reason. When our flasks are empty, would we be certain to be able to fill them again? Clearly not. Well then, we will let the water flow. It will work its way down Nadu Rally, and guide those who drink from it on the way. Good idea. With this stream as companion, there is no reason for our projects not to succeed. You are getting there, my boy, said the professor, laughing. I'm doing better than that, I'm there already. Not so quick. Let's begin by taking a few hours rest. I had in truth forgotten that it was nighttime. The chronometer soon confirmed the fact. Shortly afterwards, each of us, having eaten and drunk his fill, fell into a deep sleep. 24 The following day, we had already forgotten our difficulties. I was amazed at first not to feel thirsty, and wondered why. The stream flowing and gurgling at my feet gave me the answer. We ate and drank from the excellent ferrous water. I felt like a new man, determined to go a long way. Why should a man as convinced as my uncle not succeed, with a hard-working guide like Hans and a commit Ted nephew like myself? These were the wonderful ideas which slid into my brain. Had someone suggested going back up to the top of Snaefels, I would have indignantly refused. But fortunately the only item on the agenda was descending. Let's go. I shouted, waking with my enthusiastic cries the old echoes of the globe. We started off again at 8 a.m. on Thursday. The granite corridor, twisting and turning in sinuous paths, produced unexpected corners, talking on the complexity of a maze, but, overall, its general direction was still towards the southeast. My uncle continually consulted his compass with the greatest care, so as to be able to note the ground covered. The gallery proceeded almost horizontally, with a gradient of 1 in 35 at the very most. The stream followed unhurriedly at our feet, murmuring. I compared it to some familiar spirit guiding us down into the earth, and I caressed the warm water nymph whose song accompanied our steps. When I was in a good mood, my mind often took a mythology cal turn. As for my uncle, he was cursing the horizontality of the route, as the man of the perpendiculars.78 his route was being indefinitely extended and instead of sliding down the earth's radius, as he put it, he was almost going off at a tangent. But we had no choice, and as long as we were getting nearer the center, no matter how slowly, there was no ray sun to complain. In any case from time to time the slopes got steeper, the water nymph would start tumbling down and moaning, and we would go down deeper with her. In sum, during that day and the following one, we covered a great deal of ground horizontally, but relatively little vertically. On Friday evening, the 10th of July, according to our estimates we were about 70 miles southeast of Reykjavik and at a depth of just over 6 miles. Under our feet at this point opened a rather frightening shaft. My uncle couldn't resist clapping his hands when he calculated the steepness of the slope. It will take us a very long way, he exclaimed, and easily, for the projections of the rock form a veritable staircase. The ropes were placed in position by Hans in such a way as to prevent all accidents. The descent began. I do not dare call it a perilous descent because I was already familiar with this sort of operation. The shaft was a narrow slit cut into the mass of the rock, of the sort called faults. It has clearly been produced during the contraction of the Earth's very structure, at the period when it was cooling down. If it had formerly served as a way through for the eruptive matters vomited by Snaefels, I couldn't explain to myself how it was that these materials had left no trace. We were going down a sort of spiral staircase that you'd have said was made by human hands. Every quarter of an hour we were forced to stop and take a rest to L low our knees to recover. We invariably sat down on some projection with our legs dangling over it, we ate while chatting, and we drank at the brook. It goes without saying that the Hans Bach had become a waterfall in this fault and had lost much of its volume, but it was still more than sufficient to quench our thirst. In any case, when the slope became less steep, it would soon have to adopt its more peaceful course again. At the 78 the man of the perpendiculars, Hetzel referred to Verne's sense of the perpendicular, meaning his ability to extrapolate from fact to fiction, present point it reminded me of my worthy uncle, with his fits of impotence and anger, whilst, when following the Gendler slopes, it was like the Icelandic hunter's calm. On 11 and the 12th of July we worked our way round the spirals of the fault, penetrating 5 miles further into the Earth's crust, which made nearly 12 miles below sea level. But on the 13th, at about midday, the fault took on a much gentler slope of about 45 degrees, heading towards the southeast. The path then became quite easy, and very boring. It would have been hard for it to have been anything else. There was no way that the journey could be varied by changes in the countryside. Finally, on Wednesday the 15th we were 17 miles below ground and about 120 miles from Snaefels.
Although we were a little tired, our health was still in a reassuring state and the portable medical kit had not yet been used. Every hour my uncle noted the measurements of the compass, the chronometer, the manometer, and the thermometer, the same notes that he published later in his scientific account of the journey. In this way he could easily deduce what our position was. When he told me that we'd done this horizontal distance of 120 miles, I couldn't hold back an exclamation. What's the matter? He asked. Nothing, I was just thinking. Thinking what, my boy? That if our calculations are correct, we are no longer under Iceland. Do you think so? It is easy to check. I used my compasses to measure on the map. I was right, I said. We have gone right past Portland Point and these 120 miles towards the southeast mean that we are now in the open sea. Under the open sea, said my uncle, rubbing his hands. So, I exclaimed, the ocean stretches above our heads. Well, Axel, perfectly normal. At Newcastle, are there not coal mines which extend a great distance under the waves? The professor might find the situation perfectly normal, but the thought of walking under the great weight of the waters wouldn't stop worrying me. And yet, whether the plains and mountains of Iceland were suspended over our heads, or the waves of the Atlantic, made very little difference in the end, provided that the granite structure remained solid. In any case, I quickly got used to the idea, for the corridor, which was sometimes straight, sometimes winding, as capricious in its slopes as in its detours, but running regularly towards the southeast and working its way constantly down, was quickly leading us to great depths. Four days later, on the evening of Saturday the 18th of July, we arrived at a sort of grotto, of considerable size. My uncle gave Hans his three weekly Rix dollars, and it was decided that the following day would be a day of rest. 25 Accordingly I woke up on the Sunday morning without the normal worry about leaving immediately and, although we were amongst the deepest chasms, this was all the same very pleasant. In any case we had got used to our troglodytic existence. I hardly thought about the sun, the stars, the moon, the trees, the houses, the towns, all the superfluous aspects of earthly life which terrestrial beings consider a necessity. Since we were fossils, we didn't care a fig about such useless marvels. The grotto formed a huge hall. Over its granite floor gently flowed the faithful stream. At such a distance from its source, its water was only the same temperature as the air, and we could drink it without difficulty. After breakfast the professor wanted to spend a few hours putting his daily notes into order. First of all, he said, I am going to make a few calculations in order to find out exactly what our position is. When we get back, I want to be able to draw a map of our journey, a sort of vertical section of the globe giving the profile of the expedition. That'll be fascinating, uncle, but will your observations be sufficiently precise? Yes, I have carefully noted down the angles and the gradients. I am sure I have not made any mistakes. Let us first see where we are, take the compass and note the direction it indicates. I considered the instrument and, after a careful examination, replied, east a quarter southeast. 79, good, said the professor, noting down the observation and making a few quick calculations. I conclude that we have covered 210 miles from the point where we started. So we're traveling underneath the Atlantic. Correct. And at this moment a storm is perhaps raging up there, with ships being shaken about above our heads by waves and hurricanes. It is possible. And the whales are coming to knock their tails on the roof of our prion. Don't worry, Axel, they will not do it any harm. But let's get back to our calculations. We are 210 miles from the base of Snaefells in a southeasterly direction, and, according to my previous notes, I estimate the depth reached to be 40 miles. 40 miles. I shouted. In all probability. But that's the extreme limit that science has ascribed to the thickness of the Earth's crust. I will not contradict you. And here, according to the law of increasing temperature, there should be a temperature of over 1,500 degrees, 79 east a quarter southeast, 101 and a half e in absolute bearing. Should be, my boy. And all this granite couldn't remain in a solid state and would be completely melted. You can see that this is not the case and that, as usual, the facts are able to contradict the theories. I am forced to agree, but it still astonishes me. What temperature does the thermometer indicate? 27.6 degrees. The scientists are only out there for, by 1474.4 degrees. So the proportional increase in temperature is an error. So Sir Humphrey Davy was right. So I was not wrong to listen to him. What have you to say to that? Nothing. In fact, I would have had quite a few things to say. I didn't accept Da V.Y.'s theories at all, I still believed in the heat in the center, although I could not feel any of its effects. To tell the truth, I preferred to think that this vent was the chimney of an extinct volcano, one that the lava had covered over with a coating that was refractory and so did not allow the temperature to spread through its walls. 
but without stopping to seek new arguments, I merely accepted the situation as it was. Uncle, I tried again, I believe that all your calculations are accurate, but allow me to draw a logical conclusion from them. Go on, my boy, feel free. At the point where we are now, on the same latitude as Iceland, the radius of the Earth is about 3,935 miles. 3,936. Let's say 4,000 is a round figure. Out of a journey of 4,000 miles we've done 40. As you say. And this has been achieved at the expense of 210 miles in a diagonal direction. Perfectly. In about 20 days. In 20 days. Now, 40 miles is a hundredth of the radius of the Earth. If we continue in this way we will therefore take 2,000 days, or nearly five and a half years, to get down. The professor did not reply. And that's not counting the fact that, if the vertical journey of 40 miles has been at the expense of a horizontal one of 210, that will make 20,000 miles towards the southeast, and we will have come out through a point on the circumference long before we reach the center. The devil take your calculations, cried my uncle with an angry G.E.S. Toure. The devil take your hypotheses. What do they rest on? Who can tell you that this corridor does not go straight to our goal? In any case, I have a precedent on my side. What I am doing here, someone else has already done, and where he succeeded I will also succeed. I hope so. But finally, I have the right. You have the right to keep quiet, Axel, when you attempt to reason in that way. I could see clearly that the terrible professor was threatening to reap pear under the skin of the uncle, and so I considered myself duly warned. Now, he said, consult the manometer, what does it indicate? A considerable pressure. Good. You can see that by going down gradually, by slowly getting used to the density of the atmosphere, we have not had any problems at all. None at all, apart from a few earaches. That's nothing, and you can get rid of the pain by putting the external air in rapid communication with the air contained in your lungs. Fine, I replied, having decided not to upset my uncle anymore. There is even a real pleasure in being plunged into this denser atmosphere. Have you noticed how intensely the sound is propagated? Indeed, a deaf man would end up hearing perfectly. But this density will undoubtedly increase. Yes, following a law which has not been completely determined. It is true that the force of gravity will decrease in proportion to our descent. You know that it is at the surface itself of the earth that its action is most strongly felt, and that objects no longer have any weight at the center of the globe. I know, but tell me, will this air not finish up having the density of water? Probably, at a pressure of 710 atmospheres. And further down. Further down this density will increase still further. How will we carry on then? Well, we will just have to put stones in our pockets. Indeed my uncle, you have a reply for everything. I didn't dare venture any further into the area of hypotheses, for I would again have come up against some impossibility that would have made the professor hopping mad. It was clear, however, that the air, at a pressure which could reach thousands of atmospheres, would end up solidifying, and then, even supposing that our bodies could have resisted this, we would have to stop, in spite of all the reasoning in the world. But I did not communicate this argument, my uncle would have counter-attacked again with his perpetual sacnusem, a precedent without value, for, even accepting as true the journey of the learned Icelander, there was a very simple thing that could be said in reply. In the 16th century, neither the barometer nor the manometer had been invented, so how did Saknusem know when he had reached the center of the globe? But I kept this objection to myself and waited to see what the future would bring. The rest of the day was spent calculating and chatting. I was always in agreement with Professor Leidenbrock, and I envied the perfect indifferentiae of Hans who, without seeking causes and effects to such an extent, carried blindly on wherever fate took him. 26 It must be admitted that things had gone well until now and it would have been ungracious of me to complain. But if the average difficulty didn't increase, we couldn't miss reaching our goal. And what glory then? I had reached the point where I reasoned like a Leidenbrock. Quite seriously. Was this due to the strange environment in which I was living? Perhaps. For a few days, steeper gradients, some of them even of an alarming perpendicularity, brought us deeper into the internal rock massif. On some days we gained between 4 and 5 miles towards the center. Perilous descents, during which Hans's skill and marvelous sang Freud were very useful to us. The impassive Icelander gave of himself with an incomprehensible straightforwardness and, thanks to him, we survived more than one tricky situation which we wouldn't have got out of on our own. What was surprising was that his silence increased every day. I believe that we were even catching it. External objects have a real effect on the brain. The person who shuts himself up between four walls finishes up losing the ability to associate ideas and words. 
How many people in prison cells have become idiots, if not madmen, through lack of use of their faculties of thought? For the two weeks that followed our last conversation, nothing worth reporting happened. I can only find in my memory a single event of an extreme seriousness, but with good reason. It would be difficult for me to forget the smallest detail of it. On the 7th of August our successive descents had brought us to a depth of 70 miles, in other words, above our heads lay 70 miles of rocks, of ocean, of continents, and of towns. We must have been about 500 miles from Iceland. That day the tunnel was following a relatively gentle slope. I was walking ahead. My uncle carried one of the room corf lamps and myself the other one. I was examining the granite strata. Suddenly, turning round, I noticed that I was alone. So, I thought, I've walked too quickly, or else Hans and my uncle have stopped on the way. It's best to join up with them again. Fortunately, the path doesn't climb very much. I went back the way I had just come. I walked for a quarter of an hour. I looked. Nobody. I called out. No reply. My voice was lost in the middle of the cavernous echoes that it suddenly awakened. I began to feel worried. A shiver ran through my whole body. Let's be calm, I said out loud. I'm certain to be able to find my companions again. There's only a single path. Now I was ahead, let's go back. I went up for half an hour. I listened out to see if some call was not addressed to me. In such a dense atmosphere it might reach me from a long way away. An extraordinary silence reigned in the immense tunnel. I stopped. I couldn't believe that I was on my own. I wanted to think I was just astray, not lost. When you've strayed from your path, you can find yourself again. Let's see, I repeated. Since there's only one route, since they're full lowing it, I must meet up with them again. All I have to do is go further up. Unless, not having seen me, forgetting that I was ahead of them, they thought they had to go back. Well, even in that case, I'll find them again if I hurry. It's obvious. I repeated these last words like a man who is not convinced. What is more, to put together such simple ideas and form them into reasoning, I had to employ a great deal of time. A doubt then took hold of me. Was I really ahead? Certainly Hans had been following me, and he was in front of my uncle. He'd even stopped for a few seconds to adjust the bags on his shoulder. The detail came back to me. It was at that very moment that I must have continued on my way. In any case, I thought, I have a sure means of not getting lost, a thread to guide me through this labyrinth, one which can never break, my faithful stream. All I have to do is go back up its course and I will automatically find my companion's traces again. This reasoning brought me back to life, I resolved to start off again without losing a second. How I blessed, then, the foresight of my uncle when he prevented the hunter from blocking up the incision made in the granite wall. In this way the health-giving source, having quenched our thirst en route, was going to guide me through the meanders of the earth's crust. Before starting back up, I thought a wash would do me good. I bent over to wet my forehead in the water of the Hans Bach. My stupefaction can be imagined. Under my feet was dry and uneven granite. The stream was no longer flowing at my feet. 27 I cannot depict my despair. No word in any human language would be adequate to describe my feelings. I was buried alive with the prospect of dying from agonies of hunger and thirst. Without thinking I moved my burning hands over the ground. How dried up this rock seemed to me. But how could I have left the stream's course, for it just wasn't there. I understood then the reason for the strange silence when I had listened the last time to see if some call from my companions might not reach my ear. At the point when I had first started off on the wrong route, I hadn't noticed at all that the stream wasn't there. Clearly, at that moment, a forking in the gallery must have appeared in front of me, whilst the Hans Bach, obeying the whims of another slope, had gone off with my companions towards unknown depths. How could I get back? There were no traces at all. My feet left no imprint on the granite. I cudgeled my brain, looking for a solution to this insoluble problem. My position could be summed up in a single word, lost. Yes, lost at a depth which seemed immeasurable to me, those 70 miles of Earth's crust weighed down on my shoulders with a terrible weight. I felt crushed. I tried to take my mind back to things on earth. I could hardly do so. Hamburg, the house in Konigstrasse, my poor Grauben, this whole world under which I was lost, went quickly through my terrified brain. I relived the incidents of the journey in a brilliant hallucination, the events of the crossing, Iceland, Mr. Fredriksen, Snaefels. I said to myself that if, in the present situation, I still kept the shadow of a hope, it would be a sign of madness, 80 that it was better to give in to despair. Indeed, what human power could bring me back up to the surface of the globe or break down the enormous vaults which buttressed each OTH or over my head? Who could put me on the route back and thus help me rejoin my companions? Oh, my uncle, I shouted, in a tone of despair. 
It was the only word of reproach that came from my mouth, for I understood that the unfortunate man must himself be suffering while looking for me. When I saw myself beyond all human help, unable to try and do anything to save myself, I thought of the help of heaven. Memories of my childhood, of my mother whom I had known only at the time of kisses, came back into my mind. I resorted to prayer, however little right I had to be heard by a God whom I was addressing so late, and I implored him with fervor. This return to providence made me a little calmer and I was able to concentrate all the forces of my mind on the situation. I had three days food left, and my flask was full. However, I could not remain alone any longer. But should I go up or down? Go up clearly, continue on up. I would have to reach the point where I'd left the stream, the fateful dividing of the ways. There, once I had the stream beside my feet, I would still be able to get back up to the summit of Snaefells. Why hadn't I thought of this sooner? There was clearly a chance of being saved. The highest priority was to find the course of the Hans Bach again, 80 a sign of madness, a precursor of the self-canceling logic of Catch-22, if one is sane enough to reason, then, given the circumstances, one must be mad, and if one is mad. I got up and, leaning on my iron-tipped stick, went back up the tunnel. The slope was quite steep. I walked with hope and without hindrance, like a man who has no choice of path to follow. For half an hour no obstacle stopped me. I tried to recognize my route from the form of the tunnel, from the shape of some of the rocks, from the patterns some of the crevices made. But no particular feature struck my mind and soon I had to admit that this gallery could not lead me back to the fork. It was a cul-de-sac. I collided with an impenetrable wall and fell against it. With what horror, with what despair I was seized then, I cannot say. I lay there overwhelmed. My last hope had just broken against this granite wall. Lost in the labyrinth, whose multiple meanderings criss-crossed in all directions, I could no longer try an impossible flight. I had to die from the most terrifying of deaths and, strangely enough, it came into my mind that if one day my fossilized body was found again, encountering it seven time miles into the bowels of the earth would raise serious scientific questions. I wanted to speak out loud, but only rough sounds emerged from my dried-up lips. I lay there panting very heavily. In the midst of that anguish, a new terror came and took hold of my mind. My lamp had broken when it fell, and I had no means of repairing it. Its light was getting dimmer and was just about to give up. I watched the luminous current as it diminished in the filament of the apparatus. A procession of moving shadows flickered past on the dark end walls. I no longer dared blink or move my eyes, afraid to lose the least molecule of this fleeing light. At each moment it seemed to me that it was going to vanish and blackness would take hold of me. Finally, a last gleam trembled in the lamp. I followed it, I breathed it in with my eyes, I concentrated the whole power of my vision on it, as if on the last sensation of light that it would ever be able to see, and was then plunged into the depths of an immense darkness. What a terrible shout came from me. On earth, in the middle of the darkest nights, light never entirely gives up its rights. It is diffuse, it is subtle, but however little remains, the retina ends up receiving it. Here, nothing. Absolute darkness made me a blind man in the full sense of the word. I lost my head. I raised my arms in front of me, trying to feel my way in the most painful fashion. I started fleeing, rushing at random through this inextricable labyrinth, going down all the time, running through the earth's crust like an inhabitant of the underground faults, calling, shouting, screaming, soon bruised on the rock projections, falling and getting up covered with blood, trying to drink the blood flooding over my face, but constantly waiting for some wall of rock to come and offer an obstacle for my head to break on. Where did this mad running take me? I shall never know. After several hours, undoubtedly at the end of my strength, I fell like an inert mass along the wall and lost all awareness of existence. 28 When I came back to life, my face was wet with tears. How long this state of unconsciousness had lasted, I cannot say. I no longer had any way of keeping track of time. Never had there been loneliness like mine, never such complete abandon. After my fall, I had lost a great deal of blood. I could feel myself cov erd in it. Oh, how I regretted not being dead and that, it all still had to be done. I no longer wanted to think. I pushed every idea out of my head and, overcome by pain, rolled over towards the opposite wall. Already I could feel fainting taking hold of me again, and with it the supreme annihilation, when a loud noise struck my ear. It was like long rolling thunder, and I listened as the sound waves slowly disappeared into the far depths of the abyss. Where was this noise coming from? Undoubtedly from some phenomenon happening in the heart of the Earth's mass. The explosion of gas are the collapse of some major buttress of the globe. I listened again. I wanted to know whether this noise would occur again. A quarter of an hour went by. Silence reigned in the tunnel. I couldn't even hear any more the sound of my own heart beating. 
Suddenly my ear, by chance applied to the wall, seemed to detect words, vague, imperceptible, distant. I shuddered. It's a hallucination, I thought. But no, by concentrating harder on listening, I distinctly heard voices murmuring. I was too weak to understand what was being said. Someone was speaking though. I was quite certain of that. For a moment I was terrified that it might be my own words coming back to me through an echo. Perhaps I had been crying out without knowing. I tightly closed my mouth, and once more placed my ear on the granite wall. Yes, it's voices for sure. Definitely voices. By moving only a few feet along the side of the tunnel, I could hear distinctly. I managed to make out strange, uncertain, incomprehensible words. They reached my ear as if spoken in a low voice, murmured, as it were. The word for Lorid was repeated several times in a sorrowful tone. What could it mean, and who was speaking? It had to be my uncle or Hans. But if I could hear them, they might easily be able to hear me.